Let's pray. Father, it just seems like uh, just crazy to me that you would have me talk about you because I really cannot. But you can talk about you, Lord God. So I pray that you would overcome me and we would learn about I am. I am that I am. That you would speak to us, Lord God even through uh, your body. God, those are mysteries that are so far beyond me. So I'm just saying, help us to preach. Amen. In Romans 6.15, Paul is still responding to this question that was raised by a statement in Romans 5.19, okay? For as by one man's disobedience, the many which, like we said, must mean all. The many were made sinners. So by one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Now law, the is added by the translators, now law came in to increase the trespass, but where the sin increased, the grace abounded all the more. So in Romans 6, 15, Paul writes this. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin into death or of obedience into righteousness? Now, I apologize for all the brackets and such, but I'm trying to give the most literal translation possible, okay? It's not that the other one is wrong necessarily, but they often don't translate it very literally. Verse 17, but thanks be to God that you were once slaves, not you who, they just add that word, but thanks be God that you were once slaves of the sin, but you were obedient from the heart to the tupas, the imprint of teaching to which you were handed over, to which you were betrayed. Now, we talked about that last time. The, The obedience, obedience fills the empty tupas like blood flowing from a fountain in the temple of your soul, like liquid love poured into your heart and then out of your heart from the throne of grace and filling your empty vessel. Verse 18, and having been set free from the sin, you have become slaves of the righteousness. Now, I've included the article uh, the because Paul includes the article the, and translators often take it out, and sometimes they just put it in, and that's because um, uh, in Greek form is a little bit different than English form, um, and so they argue that the, the article either goes in or out, but, but Paul includes the article for a reason. When he simply writes law, he appears to be talking about law in general. You know, like any knowledge of good and evil that you might take from a tree or write down in a book or on a list somewhere. 
But when he writes the law, he seems to often be referring to the law of, of Moses or some other particular law. When he writes sin, he's probably referring to sin just in general. But when he writes the sin, I think he's reminding us of the root of all sin, the root sin, the sin in the garden. And some would argue that with the article, he's even personalizing sin in reference to the one who tempted us in the garden, that is the devil. Likewise, when Paul writes the righteousness, I think he is pointing to the root of all righteousness, Jesus, who is our righteousness, the righteousness that we tried to take from the tree at the devil's tempting. And that righteousness is also personal. Our righteousness is not just our idea. According to Paul in 1 Corinthians, our righteousness is a person. <laughs> our righteousness is Christ. Verse 18, and having been set free from the sin, have become slaves of the righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations, literally the weakness of your flesh. Remember we talked about the weakness of flesh a few weeks ago. It's not that your flesh feels pleasure and, and pain physically, it's that your flesh feels only its own pleasure, only its own pain. But, but if my body, if my body were a part of another body, I would feel the pain and, and the pleasure of all the members of that other body. I would participate in a higher consciousness, a psychic body. Verse 19, I am speaking in human terms, says Paul, because of well, the weakness of your flesh. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to the impurity and to the lawlessness leading to or unto or into lawlessness, now that's a wild thought, but Paul is arguing that law makes us lawless. And any parent will tell you, yeah, that's pretty much true. Make a law and your kids will do what? They will be tempted to break that law just to prove I am me and not you, mom, dad. Verse 19, for just as you once presented your members as slaves to the impurity and to the lawlessness into more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to the righteousness into sanctification. Uh, for when you were slaves of the sin, you were free in regard to the righteousness. But what fruit did you have then from the things of which you're now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from the sin and have become slaves of God, you have your fruit unto sanctification and you have the end, eternal life. For the wages of the sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. That's where the eternal life is. It's in him, as if you were like part of his body. For the wages of the sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, we, we forget this, but that word kurios in, in Greek means master. That's what Lord means. So if you call Jesus Lord, you simultaneously call yourself slave. And just to be clear, slave means slave. Not the more sanitized Hebrew version because God defined it quite a bit for, for, the, for the Hebrews. Paul's writing to the Romans. <laughs> Both sin and grace are defined as slavery in the strictest sense of the word, writes Karl Barth. Slavery defines the totality of our human existence. It defines it exactly because it is an existence from which we cannot possibly escape. Grace and sin are to one another as either is to or. So I think Paul must be saying, your old man is a slave. And your new man is a slave. So whom would you like to be your master, to whom will you present yourself? What's your choice? And yet slaves don't choose their master, do they? The master chooses the slave. So if you choose the righteousness as your master, it must be because the righteousness is choosing you, choosing within you, giving his choice somehow to, to you. But if you claim 
that you choose your master, you reject the notion that you are a slave, which is being a slave to a lie, which is the sin. Now, they'll make your head pop. That's just kind of crazy. But Paul seems to be pretty clear about this. You are a slave. Or you're a slave. <laughs> but then as if to catch himself and us, he has this. But I'm speaking um, this way because of the weakness of your flesh. Last week at Chew the Fat, we read these verses. And my friend Joseph, who watches in Arkansas, Joseph asked this great question, hard to answer. He said, how do we reconcile what Paul says about slavery here with all his talk of freedom in places like Galatians, the book of Galatians? Uh, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Do not then submit to a yoke of slavery. How do you, how do you reconcile that, asked Joseph. Now, I don't think Joseph was saying this. But a lot of Christians do say this. They often say this when they don't understand why God would allow for so much suffering in this world or in the next world. They say, well, well, um, well, God gave us free will. Free will. Yeah, 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 I feel sorry for them over there, but you know, free will. God is love. Yeah, God is love, but you know, some can never ever be saved because, well, you know, free will. Some people even say God is love, so you know he would never ever violate your free will. When my daughter Elizabeth was little, she definitely had a will. She had a very, very strong will. And I think she thought it was a free will, or at least it should be a free will. Susan and I used to say that she'd grow up to either save the world or become a dictator of some third world country, second world, maybe first world dictator, a despot, a despot. Some nights I think on about, it was at least three occasions, it might have been uh, many more, when she was a toddler, she got herself so worked up, she'd get herself so worked up that just for the sake of protecting Susan, her brother Jonathan, and herself, I literally had to hold her down kicking and screaming to her bed. In fact, I would just lie on top of her as she screamed until she pass out. In the morning, I'd be just strung out, exhausted, seriously, from worrying all night long about what she would say to her counselor when she was 32 years old. But she'd walk into the kitchen just beaming from ear to ear with a smile on her face and say, hi, Daddy, as if to thank me for saving her from herself the night before. Strong will. But I'm not so sure that it was a, a free will. One day she said to me, she said, Daddy, <laughs> and I, I'm pretty much recounting this exactly. She said, Daddy, do killer whales live in lakes? I said, honey, no, killer whales do not live in lakes. And she said, yes, they do. I took a deep breath and said, well, honey, no, killer whales do not live in lakes. And she said, yes, they do. I said, no, they don't. She said, yes, they do. The argument escalated. You see, knowledge is power, and she was tempted to exercise power over me, and so, of course, she wanted more knowledge. The, the argument escalated until she finally said, well, I'm calling Poppy. Poppy was my dad, who is also a pastor. She said, I'm calling Poppy because Poppy's been a pastor longer than you. So she called. And thank God my dad didn't back down when Elizabeth doubled down. No, honey, he said, killer whales do not live in lakes. And my daughter Elizabeth had a meltdown. She just had a meltdown. I mean, it's seriously a very good thing that she didn't have access to nuclear weapons for the world would have come to an end back in 1993. She must have been about four, I suppose, four at the time. Well, one day when she was about five, she felt like Susan and I had violated her free will just one too many times. All negotiations had broken down, and at one point, I remember, she started screaming, I don't want a mommy. I don't want a mommy. I don't need a mommy, and I don't, I don't want a daddy, and I don't, need a, I don't need a daddy. I don't want a daddy. I remember looking down at her, glaring at me with those 
those big, beautiful eyes. Her cheeks streamed with tears, and I remember thinking, oh, my heart is just breaking for you. And love would never violate free will. And so she screamed again, I don't want a daddy! And I said, okay. I drove her to the bus station, dropped her off, never talked to her again. We often wonder whatever became of Elizabeth Hyatt. But you know, free will. <laughs> actually, I, I, I didn't do that. And actually, I don't think I violated her free will because I'm not convinced that, especially at that point, uh, she had any free will. I think St. Paul would say, of course he didn't. Haven't you read the book of Romans, Peter? But whatever the case, I didn't actually drive her to the bus station. However, I did say, I did say, okay. And then I stopped talking to her. I stopped looking her in the eye. I kind of acted like she wasn't there. And Susan did too. Of course, I was more aware of her at that point than, than ever before. My heart burned for her like it had never really burned for her before. Even as I watched her mo grow more and more and more, she grew more and more miserable than she'd ever been before because she thought that she was free of me. Free of me. And yet she was in my house. She was in our house. I supplied all of her needs. I, I loved her at that point more, more than ever, but I let her think she was free, free of all of us, free of mom, free of her brother, sister, free, free of me. Sometimes I wonder if all of human history, if all of your history, if all of my history is like that day back in 1995. By the end of that day, you could call it the sixth day, Elizabeth was in complete and total agony. Although she was doing her best as to act, you know, to act independent and happy and free, I knew that she was in a prison, a prison that we have come to call me. She was an I trapped in the prison of me. I Many scientists will now argue that none of us are actually free, that we're all an I trapped in a prison called me. Experiments by the famous neuroscientist Benjamin Libet seem to indicate that our subconscious selves, that's our, that, would be, that would include our physical bodies and our psychic bodies, actually make decisions before we are even consciously aware of making them. Which means free choice is really just a game that my brain plays to justify me. And I am actually a prisoner of me. And so, not free. See, see the eye, you can barely see it up there, the eye trapped in me, the old me, the old man, the old Adam, the old me. I am not me, and I can rarely, if ever, actually control me, and yet I am conscious of me. That's a mystery. Well, whatever the case, by the end of that day, Elizabeth was not at all free. She was clearly in the prison of her own me. At one point, I mentioned that I was going to Walgreens for some reason or other, and she begged me to ride along, and so I, I mumbled, whatever. We got in the car, just her, just me. I paused before I turned the key. I looked at her, and she looked at me. And then, no lie, it was like a volcanic eruption. It was as if her little ego could not contain the spirit welling up inside. She literally just threw herself across my lap in the car, crying, I, I want a daddy, I love my daddy, I want a mommy, and I want a mommy, I love you, daddy, I love you, daddy, I love you, daddy. She was free. Suddenly, we were free and happy. I was a slave to her, she was a slave to me. We were both slaves and both free. Elizabeth is now 
32. And honestly, no one is nice, as nice to, to me as, as she. <laughs> Pop quiz. Who is free? The man on the left, Vladimir Putin, or the man on the right, the man hanging on that tree? Right now, you know, the entire world, and I pretty much mean the entire world, is utterly terrified of violating the will of Vladimir Putin. So is he free? And what about the man on the tree? Doesn't the entire world constantly violate the man on the tree? He's the will of God, that man on the tree. So is he free? Who's free? The astronaut on the left, untethered, floating in empty space? Or my daughter dancing with my dad and my dad dancing with my daughter? Who's free? The chicken leg on the, on the left that's free of the chicken? Or the chicken leg on the right that's attached to the chicken, the living chicken? Here's a tough one. Those guys in the pointy hoods, are they free? Or is it the children of slaves that they would hang on that tree? Who's free? Vladimir Putin or the man on the tree? These boys free? So uh, we've been talking about them. Are they free? That's kind of a tough one, huh? They're kind of a mix of slave and free. All little children are like slaves. I mean, you would not want to entrust either of those boys with a nuclear arsenal. It's good that they're not free. They're, they're, not, they're not free, and yet they are free, far more free than Vladimir Putin as long as they live in their father's world or their mother's backyard, as long as they're conscious of someone that is conscious of them, someone that, that loves them. And isn't that what distinguishes a superhero from a supervillain? Supervillains are only conscious of themselves. They are an I trapped in a me with like a nuclear arsenal. But Superman is willing to sacrifice his will and even his me for that of another word, in, in, uh, of, a, of another. In, in other words, he wills to love because it's been loved. Remember, faith in love is every superhero's superpower. That's what we said. Faith in love is every superhero's superpower, for love is writing the story, the super story, the gospel. And love can raise the dead. Marisa Kruger uh, sent me this great little song by Guy, Gar, Guy Clark titled The Cape. It's about an eight-year-old boy who makes a cape and jumps off the garage roof hoping to fly but instead he lands hard on the ground. But for 80 years he keeps jumping, jumping, jumping till the day he dies and Gar Clark, Guy Clark then sings, he did not know he could not fly, and so he did. Well, he's one of those who knows that life is just a leap of faith. Spread your arms, take a breath, and always trust your cape. Your cape is faith in love, and love is writing the story, love can raise the dead. A few weeks ago, we noted that every baby is born conscious only of itself, for every baby considers mom to be an extension of the self, and so every baby is alone by definition. And it's not good that the atom would be alone. 
And so every good mom and every good dad wants their baby to become conscious of self, self-conscious, as separate from other selves, which implies knowledge, uh, knowledge of the good, which is a communion of selves, and knowledge of evil, which is separation and loneliness and death. We want our babies to become self-conscious and then other conscious so they may somehow choose to surrender their conscious to another consciousness and gain a higher consciousness. In other words, that they would be willing to make space for others in their own world. That they might lose their psyches and find their psyches in another. That they might love as they've been loved so that they might return home and say, thanks mom, thanks dad for my life. And I think the Bible calls that freedom. I chew the fact my friend Joseph gave the best answer to his own question. He said, you know, Galatians 4 is what helps me the most. This is what Paul writes in Galatians 4. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles or spirits of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, I think that's the end of the sixth day, that's a Friday when it is finished, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Daddy, Father. This is a mystery and a miracle, but when you're free, when you're free, love is not imposed from the outside, right? As a law. It's not imposed from the outside as a law. In fact, that's how the tupas, the old man, grows according to Paul, like we talked about. The law reveals what I should be, but what I am not. With the law, I build my empty self. The law is like the imprint on the clay that I think is me. The imprint of love, but not love, on the clay that I think is me. But when you're free, love isn't imposed from the outside as a law. Love wells up from the inside like a fountain and begins to fill the empty tupas with life. Like, like blood fills every member of a body, a powerful body, a happy body, a, a, a super body. And when that happens, I stop trying to be me. <laughs> For me is who I am, and I'm free. The incarnation of love. I, I cry, Abba, Father, not because I should, but because that is who I am. I love then, not to justify myself, but because I've been justified. I'm, I'm free. I'm free of me, the old me, and me, the true me, is free to be who it is, that I am. The opposite of freedom, writes Soren Kierkegaard, is guilt. Guilt is knowledge of what I should be but cannot make myself. But freedom is surrender to my maker who makes me himself, the true self, the true self that is really, really me. You know, when I'm bound and determined to rule the world, which is quite often, I'm just miserable. But when I remember that I'm not called to exalt myself, but humble myself. When I remember that I'm not called to be first, but I'm actually called to be the last and the least. When I remember that I'm called to serve, I, I kind of like lose myself and find myself and I'm kind of happy. So pop quiz, is, is this man free? You know, if freedom is free will, that is freedom to get whatever you will, if freedom is a will that's unencumbered or limited by other wills, then literally no one in the entire world is as free 
as Vladimir Putin right now, it would seem. His will is literally holding every other will in this world hostage to itself. And yet Paul, who knows a thing or two about guys like this, because he was a guy like this, Paul would say, no, Vladimir is not free. For Vladimir is trapped in his me. And he's miserable as hell. What is it that Vladimir Putin wants? Everybody keeps asking that question, but it's obvious, isn't it? He wants to make himself the Superman. But he doesn't yet know who Superman is. And that Superman must make Vladimir himself. The Superman is the incarnation of love. A spoiled child is often a very, very capable child. But a rather unloved child, maybe because of something, that, the way they perceive it or something that happens to them. A spoiled child gets what um, he thinks he wants but can no longer want what he gets for what every child actually wants is love. The spoiled child tries to take love and control love but then all the more just keeps crucifying love. You know, it was the liar that said, take love and you can make yourself in the image of love, the incarnation of love, the Christ. But when we listen to the lie, we don't make the Christ, but we make the imitation Christ. In Greek, the anti, the anti-Christ. Not Jesus, but Mises. Someone said the chief punishment of the liar is not so much that he is no longer believed, but that he can no longer believe. The, the liar is a will that is free of every will, every other will, in, including the will of God, who is the truth. Now, you might call that free will, but that will is entirely alone and utterly insane. And if that's not hell, nothing is. So what is Vladimir Putin's off-ramp? Everyone seems to be asking that question. What's his off-ramp? Well, his off-ramp is exactly the same off-ramp as your off-ramp. It's the exact same off-ramp as old Rabbi Saul's off-ramp. This is your off-ramp. So is that a slave that's hanging on that tree? Or is that man the one that is truly free? Well, he's a slave. He's my slave. He's your slave. He's Vladimir Putin's slave. He said, whoever would be first among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. He, he's the slave of all because he's the slave of God. God is love. He said the Son of Man can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. He's slave to the Father. He's slave of God, slave to, 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 to all, slave to God, and, and, and God, is, God is love. And, and yet, and yet, and yet, and yet, he's free of all. For as he said, he said this, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. So he freely chooses to lay it down, for he must see that his father freely chooses to lay himself down, and doing what his father does makes him happy. He even said, my food, the thing that energizes me, the thing that, that makes me run, uh, is to do the will of my father. No man is a greater slave than he, and no man has ever been more free. He's not trying to be a superman. That is a superman. 
He's not trying to save himself. He's the Savior. He's not trying to justify himself. He is the justification. He's not trying to be righteous. He is the righteousness of God, your Father. And slave? I'm talking to you, slave. He's your master. Some people actually say Christianity does not address the issue of slavery. And yet, this is our master who has made himself a slave, whom we profess to follow. Perhaps the world can't see him because we don't see him. We're all trying to be some Christian version of Vladimir Putin, you're a slave. He's your master, and he is the righteousness of God. Romans 6, 19, so now present your members as slaves to the righteousness, leading to, into, unto sanctification, that's holiness. Holiness is a way of being that transcends um, our experience of space and time. Holiness is a way of being that transcends the limitations of our flesh. It's losing your psyche and finding it in the psyche of God. It's the humble exalted and the exalted humbled. It's the first last and the last first. It's the slaves free and all the free freely choosing to be slaves. That's the logic. That's the logos of love. He's your master, and he made himself your slave. He's the heart of your father, and he's given himself to you, and I know what you're thinking. Well, if I live like him, I could die like him. Exactly. <laughs> That's your off-ramp and your on-ramp. If we have been united with him in a death like his, we will surely be united with him in a resurrection like his. Paul just told us that, and Jesus said, pick up a cross. People knew what those were back in that day. That's your off-ramp, your on-ramp, and that's your superpower. Faith in love. Love is writing this story, and it's love that raises us from the dead. Love is our Father, and this is our Father's world, even if the rulers of this world tell us different. Although the wrong seems off so strong, he is the ruler yet. He might think, well, that thought is nice, Peter. Love is nice, but it will accomplish nothing in a place like Kiev, Chechnya, Damascus, Jerusalem. But you might think twice before advancing that argument. Jesus once informed his disciples they must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things and be killed. And Peter advanced that argument saying this shall never be. And Jesus turned to Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. Oh, it might be the devil or it might be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. Yes, you are. You're going to have to serve somebody. Mises or Jesus. Mises will turn you into a miserable despot. I doubt, really, seriously, that the devil gives a rat's ass about who wins this war, as long as he can turn all of us into miserable little despots. <laughs> maybe, maybe we already are. Faith in Mises is bondage to the devil, but faith of Jesus, the faith of Jesus, will set you free. It will turn you into a happy slave. It will turn you into the Superman. It will turn you into the incarnation of love. And love, love is writing the story. Love is writing the whole story. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love does not fail, writes Paul. And love has been poured, poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. That's just what he wrote in the last chapter. There is no firepower greater than love. Love will change the world, and love is not alone. Love is three persons in one substance, and love is happy. Several years ago at the National Youth Workers Convention, 
back when I was just a young pastor, I got to hear uh, the renowned Harvard psychologist, Dr. Robert Coles, talk about Ruby. And Ruby changed my world. Ruby Bridges was a descendant of slaves, and so some of her relatives must have actually been hung on the tree, the hanging tree, with Jesus. He said, whatever you do to the least of these, that would include those in Louisiana, those in the Ukraine, those in Russia, those in this room, whatever you do to the least of these, you do to me. 1960, a federal judge ordered the forced desegregation of the New Orleans School District. So every day, six-year-old Ruby was forced to attend the William Frank Elementary School alone because all the other students were white and none of their parents thought it was fitting for their white children to sit next to a black girl like Ruby because the New Orleans police refused to protect Ruby, the federal judge ordered federal marshals to escort Ruby to and from school every day. Every day, they would escort Ruby past a screaming mob of white people yelling, we're gonna kill you, nigger. Ah! I said the word because I think it needs to be heard. That's what we said. A federal judge called on Dr. Coles to fly to New Orleans and meet with Ruby on a regular basis. At the convention, Dr. Coles, I remember him t talking to us about how at that time meeting with Ruby, well, he was just mystified by six-year-old Ruby because she seemed so happy. She seemed so free. One day, Ruby's teacher told Dr. Coles that she had observed something strange and rather troubling uh, that morning. As usual, the four marshals were escorting Ruby um, uh, across the street in front of the crowd, she said. Some holding crosses, one woman holding a coffin with a black doll inside the coffin, and all of them yelling at Ruby. As usual, the marshals were walking Ruby through the crowd and across the street, said Ruby's teacher. But, but this morning, I, I watched as, as Ruby, she suddenly stopped and she began talking. She just began talking. The federal officers, the marshals were growing nervous. They were trying to move her along, but she wouldn't budge. She just stood there looking at the crowd and talking, said her teacher. And then all at once, she just finished and walked on into the school. Later in the day, Dr. Cole sat Ruby down and questioned her about the incident. He said, Ruby, why were you talking to those people this morning? She looked confused and she said, um, I wasn't. D Dr. Cole's reply, well, Ruby, your teacher saw you from the classroom window. You stopped and she saw you talking. Ruby thought for a moment, and then she said, well, I wasn't talking to them. I was praying. She explained as if she thought that Dr. Coles would know. Every morning before I start my walk and every afternoon, I say the same prayer. Well, this morning I forgot to say my prayer, but when I saw those people, I remembered and I stopped and said my prayer. <laughs> I pray for those people. Confused, Dr. Cole said, Ruby, you pray for those people? She said, well, yeah. He said, you pray for the people in that angry crowd that say such mean things about you? You, you pray for them? Little Ruby looked up at the eminent Dr. Coles with this confused expression on her face, and she said, well, um, don't you think they need praying for? <laughs> I suppose that doesn't occur to us, because we're all trying to be first, and don't actually believe that it's the last and the least, the poor and the meek that are blessed. Makarios, that means happy.
I suppose it's because we're actually jealous of sinners. And miserable despots and guys like Vladimir Putin. And we can't believe that guys like Jesus and girls like Ruby are free. Don't you think they need some praying for? Asked Ruby. Don't you think we need some praying for? Asked me. Don't you think we ought to be praying for Vladimir Putin? Maybe we should do some praying for Vladimir and Volodymyr and each one of us. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to start. And if you can, make my words your words. Right? That's why we pray together in public. And then in silence, um, I want you to pray for this whole situation, for all of us, okay? And then if you feel led, you're welcome to speak those prayers out loud so we can agree with you. So let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we have thought and even taught that you are a miserable despot. That you would not only surround a city and starve the people and embalm them, but that you would torture them endlessly forever and ever and ever. Father, you discipline your children, but you are not a miserable despot. In fact, you are the happy slave who longs to share his joy with the children whom he loves absolutely. And so, Lord God, we repent. We change our minds about you. And God, with maybe just a mustard seed of faith right now, each of us says we kind of like to be like you. So we receive the discipline, Father, that you would have for each one of us. And Father, we pray for Vladimir Putin. Oh God, I pray that you would give him the off-ramp. By that, I mean that you would manifest your glory to Vladimir Putin. God, that's what you did for old Rabbi Saul, breathing threats and murder and dragging your people off to death. You were his off-ramp and his on-ramp. And so, Lord God, I pray for Vladimir Putin that, Lord, you just burn the hell out of him and you would reveal your love within him and that, Lord God, it would all be to your glory. And, Lord God, I, play, I pray, we, we pray for Vo Volodymyr Zelensky Lord, uh, God, I pray that you would guard him from becoming Vladimir. That's how they're, they're made by the evil one. I pray that you would guard him, Lord Jesus, from self-righteous anger and resentment and that, Lord God, you would reveal more and more of yourself to Volodymyr Zelensky. Thank you, Lord God, for the courage and Volodymyr, thank you for the love he has for his people and guard him, Lord, from the evil one who wants to turn him into um, a miserable despot. And Father, we pray for the people of Ukraine. I uh, pray, Lord God, that they would not return evil for evil and so become what they now hate miserable despots. I pray that they could somehow, Lord God, return good for evil, which is, in fact, your 
presence. And so he burning coals even on the head of the enemy and transformed the enemy. And Lord God, I pray for the people of Russia. I pray that they would not idolize Vladimir Putin and so become miserable despots. And Father, I pray for us because we're afraid. And that just means that we've forgotten this is our Father's world. And so we've stopped running around the yard. We've lost our cape. Become miserable despots, put our faith in miserable despots. Remind us, Lord God, that to lose our life is to find it in you. Remind us that you are writing the story and you raise the dead. Remind us that it was a happy slave that spoke creation into existence. And it's a happy slave that stands on the throne of God. Jesus, you are our master. And we are your slaves. For you have made yourself a slave to us. So that we would all be free. So that we'd all be happy. So that we could return home and say thank you, Dad, for life. Our life. God, help us to trust that everyone and everything is yours. Lord, <laughs> thank you that you hear our prayers and you take them to the prayer with our means that we can understand. Help us to pray in your spirit, to bless people in their journey of reconciliation, receiving them, that we do not cast them out, Lord, but we guard the way to invite them in. Father, we thank you for the fruit. Paul talks about the fruit. We thank you for the fruit that you are growing on us. Love joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, self-control. We thank you that you turn us into your tree, a tree of life, with fruit, which is for the healing of the nations. So it was at the end of the sixth day of the week, the sixth day of creation, that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit took bread and broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. Take and eat and do it in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper and having given thanks, he took the cup. And he said, this is the covenant in my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you, and do it in remembrance of me. This is the righteousness, the righteousness of God. So let me ask you a question. Would you like to see this world change? Would you like to see it be changed? 
If the answer is yes, I don't think that's just you. That's like uh, faith in you. That's the promised seed in you. With that faith, present yourself to the righteousness of God, and the righteousness of God will turn you into himself, and the righteousness of God will use you to change the world like he did through Ruby, like he did through the old Rabbi Saul, like he does through his body in Ukraine and Russia and even in Denver. You're the body of the Superman. And so you come to the table as a miserable despot. He accepts you as you are, but you don't leave as you are. You come as a miserable despot and you leave as the body of the Superman rising from the dead. That's who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. So do you want a daddy? Well, this is the good news. You've got one. <laughs> and he's good. And this is his world. And you have forgotten that. This is his world, and you actually haven't even seen his world. <laughs> it's all around you, but we're trapped inside of me, uh, just preparing to be born. So um, this week, as you watch CNN or Fox News or MSNBC or whatever it is you watch, and you find yourself getting a little bit miserable, <laughs> like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what Volodymyr should do. I don't know what the U.S. should do. I don't know what NATO would do. Well, of course you don't know what to do. That's by design. Just, just remember, you're not the ruler of the world. When I try to make myself the ruler of the world, I become a miserable despot. When I sit there thinking, well, I'm, I need to be the best pastor. I need to do this better. I need to do that better. I need to be, I need to be, I need to be great. Well, I just get miserable. But when I remember this is my father's world, and he's good, and he's called me to be a servant, even a slave, suddenly I'm free. I'm happy, and I'm me. So in Jesus' name, believe the gospel. Amen.